Father, I thank you for the day. I pray that you would be with us as we continue our study on how to study your word. And I just pray that you would, Lord, help us to be diligent and uh, Lord, help us to be true students of your word. Father, we thank you. We love you. And it's in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So this week we are picking back up in literary context. I feel like I did a pretty good introduction of that last time, so I'm not going to repeat uh, anything really that I covered last time. What we are jumping straight into on literary context, but this really applies to context in general, but literary context specifically is the concentric circle diagram that I gave you guys a copy of a long time ago. Um, we probably still have one floating around somewhere on the table or something like that. Um, but concentric circles, it just basically looks like a bullseye on a dartboard, right? The, the bullseye, the red part in the middle, is the specific sentence that we're looking at or the, the specific uh, scripture verse that we're looking at. And then you have from the specific verse, then you have the verses around that verse, then you have the verses around that, which by then you're usually talking paragraphs and so on, which we've covered extensively in our study, each of those different elements, but now we're trying to pull them all together into a word picture, which is that concentric circle. So the idea is, in the one in the book here, I don't remember which one yours has, but it's the same idea. The one that this book has in it, it simply refers to the passage as being the bullseye, the immediate context, the rest of the larger section, and then the rest of the book, and then the rest of the Bible. The one that you guys have is more detailed, and I like that better because there are more things to consider, which is why I printed that one for you guys instead of the one that's in the book. But the point is, you start small and you work your way out for understanding the context, just like regular everyday conversation. You know, if, if you and your spouse have been talking about, um, I don't know, your, well, what Michelle and I have done recently, you know, the car that we had was costing us so much money that it just wasn't worth keeping anymore, so we knew we had to get something else. We really couldn't afford anything else, but we couldn't afford to keep the car we had either. Um, so as we're having that discussion, the immediate context, when we finally decided, okay, it's time to sell the older car, you know, okay, it's time, let's go ahead. We both knew exactly what we meant by that statement, but it would be wrong then to apply that to something else in our life, right? I mean, I don't know, I'm just making stuff up. I don't know, maybe I want to gold plate my shoes or something stupid, you know? Well, it would be wrong for me to take Michelle making the statement, okay, let's do it, to my shoes, right? Or the example that I gave you guys previously about the, the guy overhearing the other couple and taking their conversation and applying it to his life, right? Context is important. And the immediate context, the stuff that's immediately surrounding whatever it is that you're talking about is what's going to give you that immediate context. So start small and then branch out. If you want to know what a specific passage means, study that verse, then study the verses that are immediately around it. Then go to the paragraph level like we've talked about before. Then go to the level of a discourse. What's the overall argument within this section of a given book? And also don't ignore genre like we've talked about before. And then branch out the examples that I've given you before. Um, Paul, in the book of Romans and throughout Paul's writing, Paul has a different, a very different way of using the idea of the law compared to the book of James. Paul has a very different way of using the idea of grace than the book of James. Those words ultimately still mean the same thing but the way that those authors are using them is different. So if you look toward the outer portions of the concentric circle that you have, you'll see where it talks about, in one of those concentric circles, it says something to the effect of other books by this author or something like that. And that's why that's important to do each of those steps. So I'll, I'll give a quick example from 1 Peter 5, 7. 
Uh, most people that have been in church for a while, you probably speak this verse. You've probably heard this verse. You may have heard an entire sermon just on this verse. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. That's the perfect calendar tear-off scripture verse. And you guys know I'm not the biggest fan of those calendar tear-offs. It's not because it's bad to be reminded of a verse every day, but the problem is when you don't bother figuring out what else is going on that is the cause for that phrase. If, if I don't know, if you've messed up, let's say that somebody uh, got caught with pornography, because that's a common thing, and, you know, years later you're still dealing with the aftermath of it. And let's say the wife says, you know, I, I love you and I'm trying to trust you. And all you hear is, I'm trying to trust you. There's going to be problems because if that's all you're receiving, you're both going to continue reacting to that. If you miss the I love you, then you're missing the heart behind it. And if you miss the fact that that's a consequence of your behavior at some point, now there's a difference in holding it over somebody forever, and that's a different discussion for a different day. But if somebody has fallen in a given area, let's say that there's a pastor, you know, the history of, of well, I mean, let's just be honest, this church and many churches. Say there is a pastor that mishandled money at some point. Right or wrong, churches tend to crack down on that to the point of squeezing the life out of ministry. That's a consequence of having dealt with that. Now, at some point, you've got to get real and relax. But at the same time, that particular pastor, you're never going to trust again, and it's going to take time, and it's going to be hard to trust again. So hold that balance. That's more of a counseling thing at the moment than anything. But most of the time, we'll hear somebody say, you know, well, the Bible says cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. And that's true. But let's look at the context. Let's go at least to verses 5 through 9 and see what this is actually saying. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, because God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand. And that is a powerful verse. The the emphasis here, this is a conclusion to an argument that started a long time ago in this book, for one. And for two, this is not a, a let's sit down and talk about this together. This is a Moses on the mountaintop calling down fire from heaven statement. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Then in verse 7 it says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Then it continues, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, stand firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kinds of suffering or the same kind of sufferings. So, is this verse talking about when you're struggling with whether or not you can make a car payment? No. Could it apply to that? Yes, but that's not what it's talking about. What is this verse actually talking about? Yes. And, and specifically... What, what is going on in that season that it's referring to right now? <clears throat> See, in this context, it's talking about humility related to spiritual warfare. And you can throw in persecution from some of the other arguments prior to this. See, it, starting in verse 5, in the same way you who are younger submit yourselves to your elders. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. 
So in verse 5, it's talking, it's, it's using the dual meaning of the word elder here. It's talking both about people who are older and more experienced, and I think it's also a reference to the leaders in the church. But in this case, it is more about those who, in theory, are more mature than you. So it's saying, in the same way you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. So we've sort of referred to the church structure. Now he's talking about brother and sister in Christ. That's the relationship of believers with each other. Humility toward one another. Why? Why should we be humble toward each other? Because God opposes the proud and shows favor to the humble. So in other words, there's an attitude check going on here. Then he repeats it with some of the strongest language in the entire book. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand. In other words, it's the same thing as when you warn a child that a spanking is imminent. If you cross this line, there will be a spanking or whatever discipline you want to use. But this is the idea of a spanking. When you're telling that child, if you cross this line, you are going to face the consequence. That's what this is. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand. That is the threat of violence from God. That he may lift you up in due time. See, hands can be implements of discipline, and they can also be implements of love and care. So the idea is you either humble yourself under God's mighty hand before he, Aaron paraphrase, before he smacks you, and in due time if you do this, that same hand instead of smacking you will lift you up. That's the word picture here. Now it would be very easy to be stressed and to be anxious about what's going on. And again, we'd have to go further back in the context to understand specifically what he's writing about. But we already have enough of an idea here. There is a struggle between, uh, related to persecution, there's a struggle between being humble and being proud, and specifically within the church, it's talking about the idea of humility in the way that we deal, each, deal with each other. But all of this in the context of persecution, and we know that not only through previous context, but verse 8. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Stand firm in the faith. See, this is the stuff that the people are stressed about. That's why Peter's writing this. Resist him. Stand firm in the faith. In other words, when you feel like your temptation, I don't know what your deal is. All of us have an area that we're tempted to sin. All of us usually have many areas that we're tempted to sin, but usually there's one or two key strongholds. Those are things that we have been fighting for years, and we continually, you know, okay, God, I'm going to give this up, and then almost immediately we pick it right back up and continue running with that sinful habit. That's a stronghold. That is a spiritual stronghold. That's what he's talking about here. Be alert and of sober mind. Why would you need to be alert and of sober mind? Because it's easy to fall back into that sin. You know, you, 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 you finish repenting before God. You pray, I'm sorry, Lord. I, I'm trying not to do this anymore. And then almost immediately you catch yourself doing it again. And then you go through this whole guilt cycle. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Right? That takes effort. But that also means there's going to be a great deal of stress and anxiety related to it. Standing firm in the faith. Not, he didn't say stand firm. He said standing firm in the faith. It's a reliance upon God. That goes back to the humble yourselves. See, it's easy to think, well, this is a bad habit, so I'm just going to break my bad habit. And we go through the steps, right? The 12-step programs. There's nothing wrong with those. But one of the problems is that what they're really teaching is self-reliance. And what does the Bible teach? Reliance on God. Now, I'm not saying the 12-step things are bad, but they miss the mark slightly. Because the idea here is when you're fighting against sin, it's a matter of humility before God. Resist the devil, resist him, standing firm in the faith. 
because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings, and that brings it right back to persecution. So cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. It's talking about someone who's trying to repent and walk away from sin and someone who is trying to deal with the anxiety of persecution. And by the way, we're talking real persecution, not what is generally the American version of persecution. In America, if Disney does something we don't like or if somebody doesn't like us anymore because we're a Christian, that's usually what Americans call persecution, but that's not. That's just dealing with people and life. That's just life. Persecution is when there are consequences on you or your family because of your faith. And I'm talking real consequences, like you can't be a Christian and have this job, or recant for being a Christian or die. That's persecution. The person at work doesn't want to talk to me at the water cooler anymore. That's not persecution. That's just somebody that's resisting the gospel and you happen to be the messenger. So the point here, though, back to the concentric circles, the only way that you're going to understand, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you, that is a standalone statement when it's said like that, right? I mean, it's, it's easy to just take that verse and run with it. And it can apply in many ways. But when we're searching for meaning, when we're searching for what God's actually teaching us, the immediate context tells us that the anxiety it's talking about isn't, I don't know that I'm going to be able to pay my car note or my electric bill. That's not the type of anxiety it's talking about. This is talking about spiritual warfare and persecution. Then, once you understand that, you understand the context, then you can look at ways to apply it. Do you think that God cares about whether or not you can pay an electric bill or a car note or whatever? Of course. Jesus, in one of his great discourses, he says, look at the, look at the sparrows, right? Look at the hair on your head. Not a single hair falls and God doesn't know it. Look at the lilies of the valley. They don't work. They don't store up. They don't do anything except exist. And yet, Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed or dressed like one of these. The point of that section is that Jesus is telling us God cares very much for every little detail of our lives. All the stuff that stresses us out, God does care about that. And he does want to comfort us and provide for us at whatever level that means, because it's according to his will. So, is it true that God cares for all of your anxiety in the literal sense, like any and all anxiety that you could possibly have? Yes. Is it true that he wants you to place those on him and trust in him? Yes. But this isn't the verse for that. This verse is talking about strongholds and persecution. You can apply it through other verses. Does that make sense? So we've got to be really, really careful with context. Again, if you don't get anything else out of this study, that's what you're going to take away. Any questions on that before I move on to the next section? Okay. Let's see. Um, you guys have heard me talk about this before, so I'm not going to spend much time. Uh, dangers of ignoring literary context. I feel like I went into that a lot last time, so I'm not really going to repeat much there. The book repeats a little bit. Uh, the first danger is ignoring the surrounding context. I feel like I've already established that. Uh, the other one is uh, topical preaching. I've talked to you guys about that before. Uh, topical sermons are when the pastor has a topic that they're preaching on, like I'm preaching on who is God, specifically a few of God's attributes today. Well, it's a topical sermon because there's not one single place in Scripture that I can go and find all of them listed and defined. I have to tie together multiple passages. And the book is warning us, just like I have talked with you guys before, and this is the reason most of the time when I preach, I prefer to start in a passage and work my way through it verse by verse. Because if I work through it verse by verse, I'm going to be faithful to the context. If I'm faithful to the context, that means that I'm faithful to the meaning. If I am faithful in 
teaching you accurately what God says, then I have done my job as a pastor preacher in communicating God's word to you. It gets dangerous, not wrong, it gets dangerous when you do topical sermons or if you're a Sunday school teacher or a teacher of any sort, it gets dangerous when you do topical things because it can be very easy to miss the immediate context and the thought flow that the author is trying to communicate. So for example, if somebody is preaching on, let's see, what is the example here? Well, I don't, this specific example doesn't even matter. The point is, if you have three different passages, the example it gives here is John 10, Psalm 23, and Acts 2. And I'm not going to bother reading all the detail and boring you with that on the example the book is giving. But the point is, there is a progression in John chapter 10. There are several thoughts that John is stringing together to arrive at a conclusion. So if I reach in and pick one of those thoughts out, it would be very easy, just like in the First Peter passage a moment ago, it would be very easy to miss the immediate context, or even if the pastor understands it, not to teach you, here's the immediate context. Now, sometimes you will misunderstand the passage without the immediate context. Sometimes the verse is plain enough that you don't have to go in-depth explaining it. But then, for example, John 10 was one that the book uses, Psalm 23 is another one in Acts chapter 2. Well, if you pick different thoughts that are in different places in that, are in that uh, author's argument, it would be very easy to manipulate the scriptures, whether intentionally or not. It would be very easy to start to put things together in a way that fits what you want to say rather than what scripture says right? Just like if you have a family that has more than one person in it. It's, have you ever caught yourself in one of those situations where the entire family has had a misunderstanding of some sort? And I don't even mean, that's not even my polite way of saying like a big argument. I mean like literally you all just missed each other somewhere. You talk to one family member and they say, okay, well this is what I understood. And you talk to another family member, this is what I understood. You talk to a different one and they had something else, right? Those misunderstandings happen because there's not solid communication where everybody's discussing it at the same time in a logical manner. The solution to that problem is having family business meetings. The reality is most of us aren't going to and or don't feel like we have the time. But it's easy to have one of those misunderstandings and then realize later that everybody took something slightly different from what they thought they heard. Does that make sense? Do you guys connect with that example? Okay. It's the same thing when you're doing a topical sermon or lesson. It's very easy to go, okay, let's see. I want to preach on anxiety. So I'm going to Google or use a concordance or whatever. Every verse that has the word anxiety, I'm going to pull that up. And then I'm going to read and, okay, well, you know, I want to teach people to trust in God no matter what happens. So then you end up in your First Peter passage, right? And you pull out that verse, First Peter 5, 7, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. And then you start teaching and preaching about the love of God and how much God cares for you and God loves you and he wants the best for you and anxiety is bad because it robs us of our joy and therefore so that we can have joy in Christ we should put all of our anxiety and our worry upon God and know that he loves and cares for us and he's going to make it right. Is that necessarily a biblically wrong message? Not necessarily, depending on how I spin each of those things, right? But the overall message is not wrong, but that is not the message of 1 Peter 5, 7. So if I'm doing a topical sermon, I have just taught you how to misunderstand Scripture, how to cherry pick a verse and twist it completely out of context and mean something that it doesn't mean. So if you or I are teaching topically like I will be today, it is very important that the passages that you use are either self-evident, they truly do stand on their own with just what they say, 
or that you teach enough of the context that people understand, here's what this means, as opposed to what it would be easy for it to mean. And that's why you've got to pay special attention to who's teaching you. And I don't just mean me, because I know you've got the internet, and you have the ability, whether you do or not, I don't know, but I know you have the ability to listen to other people, and great, I want you to grow in your faith. And listening to me once a week is not really going to help you grow in your faith very much. That's one hour, maybe two, if you're in this Bible study, that I get to influence you. And how many hours are there in a week? Anybody know? A bunch. I get two. If you listen to every video that I put out, I might get four hours with you. Maybe. Well, four hours, even just in one day, is not very much. You know, and again, I'll use the teacher analogy, right? It's, it's the bane of a teacher's existence when parents act like the teacher is supposed to be able to fix all the problems with their kid. It's like, look, I have the kid for six, eight hours a day. You've got him at home for all the rest of the time and the weekend. I'm not a miracle worker. I can only do so much. Well, that's the vanity of preaching. At best, I have one to four hours to influence you throughout the week. And especially this past year with the pandemic, can't even meet outside in general. So be very careful when you're listening to sermons and lessons about the way that they treat Scripture. If they're cherry-picking and not giving you an understanding of what the passage means, they're doing you a disservice. They are not faithfully teaching the Word of God, even if their intention is good, they are not faithfully teaching you the Word of God. So pay extra careful attention, especially when somebody is doing a topical message of some sort, which, you know, in all honesty, how many messages in the church, and I don't just mean Reevesville, how many messages in the church at large are topical? I'd say 80% of the churches I've ever been in, almost all of the sermons are topical. I really like the ones where the majority of them are expositional. But here's the problem. In modern America, people don't have the patience for exposition. It's, it's the microwave culture scenario. See, exposition means that you have to pay attention. Exposition means that you have to listen. Exposition means that you have to be consistent in showing up and listening and hearing and then meditate on it. Exposition means you have to be humble enough, going back to our first Peter passage, you have to be humble enough to go, okay, God, I don't have all the answers. I need you to teach me. Topical, on the other hand, it gets the job done. Now, again, I do teach topically. I'm going to be preaching topically today because sometimes what needs to be said can't be found in just one passage. Sometimes what needs to be said, you have a lot of passages. Again, today we're talking about who is God, and I'm talking about some of the attributes of God. Well, there's not a God 101 book. There's not one place that I can go in Scripture where it lifts out everything that I need to know about God and puts it in a way that I can understand. We learn all of these things about God by reading the Bible over and over and being so familiar with it that we understand who he really is. So topical is not bad. It is dangerous if it is not done correctly, right? Is, is a vehicle good or bad? Depends on who's driving and what they're doing with it, right? A vehicle can be used to take somebody to a hospital that's about to die. That's a good thing. A vehicle can be used by a drunk person to run into somebody and kill them. That's a bad thing, right? So the method is the vehicle. Whether I go expositional verse by verse, that's a vehicle. Whether I go topical, that's a vehicle. But one is inherently more dangerous than the other. So the majority of your study, do you think you should do the one that is more effectively accurate or the one that is more dangerous for the majority of your study? It's the no-brainer, right? It's kind of like somebody that wants to own a motorcycle. 
It's inherently more dangerous by far. If somebody wants to own one and drive it, okay, more power to you. Um, but there's a reason that your spouse is probably going to have a problem if that's your main mode of transportation, right? And if not your spouse, your mother, right? Unless your mother was a Harley rider or something. But, but right, you get the idea. Maybe that's not the best analogy, but you get the idea. When one is inherently more dangerous than the other, it's not that taking the Harley out is a bad thing necessarily, but you need to acknowledge and recognize the extra inherent danger, and it, it seems to lack sense if you have a safe vehicle to always use the one that's not safe. Does that make sense? I've apparently, I apparently I've stepped in something. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm seeing the laughs over there. All right. Um, that is it for this chapter. So today's lesson's a little bit shorter. Um, any questions on the material from today? All right, if you don't still have it, take a copy of that bullseye with you and shove it in your Bible or wherever it is that you study so that you have that with you. Um, and then any other questions in general? And we've got, we've probably got about another 10 minutes that we can go if you have any specific questions. Yeah. And because we, we came from, from larger churches where mm -hmm. that's kind of how they get all the people in the door. Is they, yeah. They're, and, and they're not all bad sermons. I'm not trying to talk bad, but I, I, I've heard yeah. a lot of good things from them. Yeah. But, and they can fill up an hour long sermon with two Bible verses that that's not even what they're really discussing about. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. And that's called a springboard sermon. Yeah. And it's the idea of when you're standing at the edge of a pool on a diving board. You, you jump up and down on it once or twice and then jump in the water, and those two don't really have anything to do with each other. That's why that's called a springboard. And unfortunately, that is the most common. If you want to fill up a church, if you want to just get people in the door, springboard sermons are the way to go because you can talk about whatever you want and make everybody feel good. Um, and then topical. I learned a lot about leadership. Yes. Right, but yeah. Not necessarily the Bible. Yeah. And that's the danger. And that's, I think that's, that's exactly the danger. There's, you know, there are a number of churches, well, um, plenty of them in the area, but yeah, it's, it is sadly common. And unfortunately, that's where, you know, the, Jesus spends so much time talking about the difference between people that want to hear versus people that don't. Um, you know, there's, I think it's Timothy, you know, in the end days, they will look for, um, I'm going to paraphrase, but the, the itching ears passage, you know, they're going to look for uh, essentially people to validate what they want, and that is the danger of it. Um, yeah. And I've done, I've done one or two springboards over the years, but it's more been like a topical springboard. Um, but yeah, it's, it, is, it is definitely the most dangerous way to try to preach is springboarding because it's really all on you to be faithful to Scripture at that point, which if you're using one verse to get somewhere else, it's nearly impossible to do that faithfully. So, Kind of like when you grew up and your mom told you to eat your vegetables instead of dessert. You know, you got to eat your Wheaties. Yeah. For that God will, God will always bless everything you, you ever do, you know. And, uh, and, but if you go back and you read that whole verse, that's not really what he's talking about. Yeah. So. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. There are a lot of favorite pet verses. All right. Well, I'll close this in prayer. Father, I thank you for the day, and I pray, Lord, that you would help us to be faithful and Father, especially now that we understand the difference, if we didn't know before, 
I pray that you'd help us to remember, Lord, uh, the difference between uh, faithfully studying a passage and faithfully looking for the meaning that you have given us to understand versus just kind of flying by the seat of our pants and making it up as we go. Lord, I pray that you'd help us be faithful in seeking your face. Lord, you've given us the ability to draw near to you and to know you. And I pray that you'd give us the diligence and the desire. Father, we thank you. We love you. And it's in Jesus' name. Amen.